When I was 16, I started dating this boy in the church, and uh, we'd pretty much grown up with each other, so we were like really good friends. We knew each other really well. Our friends were really supportive of us dating because they knew both of us. The first year was really, really well. Like, you know, we always hung out with each other, got along really well, no disagreements or anything like that. A little after a year, you know, people in my high school knew that, you know, I had a boyfriend, and they would come up at like lunchroom conversations, you know oh, how long have you guys been dating? And I would tell them about a year. And one guy actually said, oh, so you guys, like, have you guys had sex? And I told him, no, I hadn't. And he was like, wow, if you were my girlfriend, I definitely would have dumped you by now, because that's just ridiculous to be holding out on a guy like that. You know, you really don't love him. I felt so hurt, like, you know, this person who doesn't know me, they're judging me in my relationship. And then on top of that, you know, like, they're kind of offending me, like, they're insulting me in front of all these people that I don't even know as well. Definitely wondered what was going through my boyfriend's mind at the time. But if the guys are saying that in my school, guys who I don't even know if they think this, like what is he thinking? What are his guy friends telling him? The pressure from school was a big deal about it because, you know, those are your school friends and when they talk about things in school, you kind of want to like know what they're talking about. And us dating for so long, you know, there's always that obvious physical attraction. But just like the two opposing pressures, like the people at church saying, you know, this is the right way and then people at school saying, well, this is the right way. It was just... It was really conflicting for me because, you know, you kind of want to please everybody but still be true to yourself kind of thing. And it kind of ended because we did take a step too far. It wasn't sex, but it wasn't exactly something that we should have been doing. It was um, photos. I really didn't want to do it at first because I was just like, this is so strange. Like, you know, I'm not comfortable doing this. I wouldn't even be comfortable taking a picture of myself regularly, like, you know, just for recreational purposes. It was the pressure from people in school like you know that was one of like the cool things to do and I didn't do it to be cool it was just it was kind of one of those things where I could kind of like skim the borderline not having sex but you know I'm still kind of you know not leaving my boyfriend hanging I'm giving him something that you know he wants and I, I just really thought of it as you know like I can't just be the only one in my relationship like saying no 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 I should be giving I should be contributing is what I thought I didn't want to like withhold from him anything and be a bad girlfriend and then people in school, some of them were like, you know, wow, I never thought you would do that. That's awesome. But that was my personal way of shutting them up about it. His parents found out because his email was left open and his mom was just, you know, being nosy, I guess. And she just went through some of them and she saw them. And then right then and there, she called my parents and we kind of had a meeting like that night. Then it was kind of like a mutual agreement that we should break up. Even though the people at school were like commending me about it, it just made me feel even worse. Cause it's like in the end, I kind of did shut them up, but it was like, it wasn't the way that I wanted to. You know, I still, like I said, I didn't go all the way, but it was just something like, I still compromised. So even though they were saying, you know, oh, that's great, that's awesome, it just, I still felt like, you know, like crap about it. I remember when I first became a Christian, I, I still remember my very first prayer. I, I said to God, whatever you do, don't let me lose my friends. Because to me, that was all that mattered to me back then was, you know, image, popularity, whatever else. But as I started studying the Bible, I realized, okay, following Jesus is going to be a lonely road. Um, and I also discovered that just by talking to my friends about him. And, and in scripture, it's so clear. It says there's this narrow road that leads to life and very few will find it. 
but then there's this broad and easy road that leads to destruction and, and many will enter through it. So if I want to be one of those few that find life, it's going to be difficult. And again, there's going to be very few of us. And in scripture, there's, there's so many people that in different periods of time, they had to stand alone. Like Jeremiah, he had to stand against the whole city. God told him, look, no one's going to believe your message. You're going to be completely alone. And he did it. And so you realize, okay, that's what we're up against. And I think we have to, as Christians, have a, an eternal perspective. We have to understand how short this life is. And that's easy for me because my background, my mom died giving birth to me. My dad remarried and then my stepmom died when I was nine in a car accident. My dad got married again and then when I was 12, he died of cancer. So by the time I was in high school, I understood, okay, this life is really short. I've got to focus on the next life. And, and it's hard to maintain that, that perspective because of the, the pressure. But one thing that really helps me is realizing that there will be no cowards in heaven. Revelation 21, when it talks about the end, it talks about the one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God, he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. It's so clear, I, I refuse to be a coward. I don't wanna be listed there as one of those that wouldn't stand up for God because earlier he says, there's gonna come a day when it says God will dwell with them and he will be his people, they will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God and he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Neither thou shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And that's what I want. I want to be one of those conquerors, even if that means I stand alone, because I want to be with him forever. Well, it's always crazy to gamble with your life. I, I, I mean, yeah, your life is a vapor. It's over any moment. And just to think, I'll gamble with a lot of things. I'll take risks, but we're talking about eternity here. And so that always gets me focused. But it's, it's not even just about the future, though. When the Bible talks about eternity, it's talking about that's really started for us right now. The Bible gives us so many reasons why we need to start living that way now. I mean... First and foremost, it talks about how Christ could return at any time and you want to be found living the way he wants you to be living when he returns. I mean, you gotta, you gotta be thinking, okay, if Christ returned at this moment or this moment or this moment, what would my life look like? But, but, but even beyond that, you, you gotta understand God's commands. God's commands were given for our good. Um, I remember when I first became a believer, I used to think, oh man, I gotta obey this one, this one, this one. But over time you realize, okay, that actually works out to my benefit. I, I, I used to be so confused by uh, Psalm 119 because the psalmist there would say, open my eyes that I may behold the wondrous things out of your law. And he begs him, he goes, hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. Like, he says, my soul is longing for, for your rules. I mean, when do we ever long for rules? But the whole point is he understands that okay, God gave us these commands for our good, it's for our lives. I, I mean, when have you ever met a drug addict that was actually grateful that he was a drug addict? When have you met someone who uh, committed adultery and lost his family and everything goes, oh, I'm glad I gave all that up. It's, it's this thing where the Lord who created us gave us these commands. He says, hey, don't murder. I think life would be a lot better if you didn't kill each other. You know, don't, don't steal from each other. It'd be nice if you know, when, you know, don't lie. Don't do. 
These, these were all for our good. And, and the other thing that the Bible teaches is when you take it to the end, like these temptations, they don't just stay at this level. It's once you give in, you get deeper and deeper and deeper. No one, no one turns into a drug addict overnight. No one turns into a murderer overnight. It's, it's that hatred that starts building up. It's, it's the little temptation that gets further and further into it. Um, James talks about this in James chapter one. He talks about how um, it starts off as this temptation. And he says each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And so it's not like you're tempted and then you're in this you know, major sin that leads you toward death. It says, no, you get tempted. You go, oh, that looks pretty good. Then you jump into it a little bit further and it's like this, you know, like a whirlpool, like you're on the outer edge going, oh, that's kind of fun. But before you know it, you're sucked in, you're sucked down. And that path always leads to death. While we are called to stand alone, there's no doubt that God didn't call us to live an isolated life. Friends are huge. The Bible talks about fellowship. and In uh, Hebrews 10, it talks about how you can't forsake meeting together with one another. But the point of that is to spur one another, it says, on to love and good deeds. And so when we get together with other Christian friends, the whole idea is that we spur them on. But, but a lot of times we complain and we go, well, I don't have any other Christian friends that encourage me. And well, you've got to start that. Someone's got to be the one that sets the example and goes to the other quote unquote Christians or the people who call themselves believers. And, and you just encourage them and say, hey, man, I'm praying for you because you're, you're kind of diving into this direction a little bit and setting that example and saying, man, I'm praying for you. Can I help you in any other way? And then as they see your example, they start doing that back to you. But absolutely, we're, we're not called to do this by ourselves. At times we will be, but the general rule is God's called us to be that type of friend that encourage other, encourages others to have that type of courage. I mean, that's what the word encourage means. It's like giving courage to someone else to be willing to stand for Jesus. When I was playing tennis after um, like my parents were going through a divorce and stuff, it was really hard to be real with my like close group of girlfriends um, that go to my church and go to my school. Just everything that really I'd grown up knowing um, about my family and was just kind of gone and instead of facing that and like persevering through it, I just kind of was like, I don't care anymore. I was playing doubles um, with my doubles partner from school and we had just finished like an adult tournament. They had all the alcohol out for these um, adults and he was in charge of cleaning it all up at the end and he was like, hey, do you want some? And I was like, okay. Um, just, I just kind of fell into it like it was no big deal. I pretty much after that first drink, it was game like on kind of thing. Um, just it didn't matter at that point. Like I'd already done it, and I just felt kind of like I'd given up. Anytime really alcohol was around, I just felt the need like to rebel, just against my parents, rebel against anything that was keeping me towards um, like us loving God more. And it, it showed in my friends. I kind of dropped off on my like close Christian girlfriends. I kind of put up a wall and um, like picked up and got closer to those friends that didn't love Christ. I'd been raised the right way. I knew, I knew that I was doing the wrong thing. I was still involved with church at the same time and I was drinking on weekends and then showing up at Bible study and um, youth group. I was keeping up two different images. It just became like easy. Like I'm gonna put on a smile at church while I'm going off and doing other things. And um, just my faith became um, plastic. After a few years, I was thrust into a leadership position that I had applied for leading junior high students. I was like, that's it, like I can't, I can't be drinking. I can't be following this crowd if I wanna lead. I've got to be working on my own relationship with Christ so that I'm growing so that I can encourage them to grow as well. I look back on it and I'm like, that was such a bad representation of like, how to love God and frustrates me, like even to like now, just to think about um, how bad of a job I did 
representing someone who like loves Christ so much. This year, my coach was like, you got to be the leader. Like, you've been here for four years, and I'm the only four-year returning girl. And I was like, if I'm going to be the leader, I'm going to do this right. And um, We've been praying before game, before and after games and after practice every day, and just to know that I can be that example and um, have that influence on them and just plant seeds is just so beneficial to me and, like, worthwhile. Galatians 4 talks about how we're no longer slaves, but we're sons. Uh, God doesn't look at me as his slave, he sees me as his, his child. And, and that's huge, especially when you've messed up. Um, now, now, I had a weird background where my dad was borderline abusive, um, just never encouraging. Every time I messed up, I just felt like, he, he hates me, he can't stand me, and I, I kind of was left with that impression. It was, it was hard not to think of God that way. Like, oh, I screwed up, he hates me, he rejects me now, he doesn't want to have anything to do with me. Um, and then I had kids of my own, and I've got four kids, and, and I tell you, I'm crazy about them, and they screw up all the time. I mean, they're the biggest goofballs, and, but I love them. I love them. You know, they're they're my children. They're not like like these objects of, of wrath or something. They're, they're, they're objects of my love, and I, I just want to be close to them. And when they mess up, and they have the sincerity of, Dad, I'm so sorry. It's like I'm the first to go running to them. I, I just want to say, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Let's just let's just get let's just get in love again. You know, come over here, hug me. Let, let's go out. Let's let's work this out um, because I can't stand being apart from them. And so it was so good once I had my kids and had that relationship to realize God calls me his son. And he says, look, I want this relationship like you do. God's not up there waiting for me to mess up so he can shun me or, or cast me aside. Instead, he's, he's wanting that repentance. He's wanting me just to come back, crawl back into his arms, say that I'm sorry. And that's such a comforting thought because Look, as courageous as we want to be, there will be those times when we mess up. And the last thing you want to do is distance yourself from God out of the shame or feel like, okay, I blew it. I blew my testimony. No, that's exactly what Satan would love for you to do. You got to get back on your feet, get back on your feet now. Be courageous enough to come before the Father and just admit that you messed up. But he's sitting there waiting, waiting to embrace you. So here are a few things we talked about today. God has called us to be holy and set apart. That means we don't fit in with the majority of people. And we're all going to blow it sometimes. But God gives us the chance to start over. Now is the time to dig into scripture and find examples in the Bible of those who were set apart for God. They weren't perfect either, so you're not alone. We'll see you next time.